Christian McCool with a hop and a skip. <laughs> Banging on Beckham. I had a nickel for every time I trusted your word I could fund this Baywalk oh, myself. Oh, Lord Almighty. We're breaking your word to everybody. We're going to take a break. Drama on the dais. Motion carries 4-1. to one. As a mini. <laughs> Miami Freedom Park is a go. The building of this stadium and this development will not take one penny of taxpayer dollars. Not one cent. The man with the plan is here, live. Motion carries. Uh, I would say congratulations, Commissioner. Florida schools have a new leader and changes coming to the classroom. Strides that we've made in this state up to this point don't matter if you don't continue to build on them. The South Florida senator and educator now State Education Commissioner at the crossroads of state politics and education is here live. New election police. It won't change what the voter sees on election day. Securing the vote or making it harder. Months away from elections 22. The big news of the week and the newsmakers all live this week in South Florida. Good morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. Michael is off today. We have a packed program for you today and we begin with a decade of drama now over the goal line. David Beckham's Major League Soccer Dreams in Miami came down to a few tense hours at the Miami Commission this week. Star power, power brokering, public promises, behind the scenes negotiations and only in Miami style drama on the dais. In the end, the vote was as predicted from the beginning, 405 Miami commissioners gave the green light to proceed with the billion dollar private redevelopment of the public Melrose Golf Course into a soccer centric entertainment hotel and business complex, the eventual home to Inter Miami MLS soccer. David Beckham is the celebrity headliner, but the real star of this business show is his Miami partner, Jorge Mas, spearheading the deal and the development and right here with us live. Jorge, great to see you. Thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure, Glenn, and great to see you once again. So I have a lot of questions today and um, for okay. anyone watching what went on, I mean, you know, people are pretty familiar with the deal and the question and the renderings we've seen of this idea to turn this billion dollar investment into a, a complex of sports and entertainment. And, and so I guess the real question is what went on behind the scenes on Thursday in the Miami Commission that made you walk out onto the, into the commission chambers pretty sure you had those four out of five yeses? Well, uh, Glenna, first of all, um, you know, my, my confidence and my optimism um, preceded Thursday. Uh, but I went into Thursday very confident uh, for one primary reason. You know, four years ago, or you know, almost four years ago, the voters had spoken. You know, we, we took this project and this idea to the voters of the city of Miami. And in resounding fashion, um, you know, with over 60% of the vote, gave us a go ahead to negotiate with the city of Miami. It was long, it was drawn out, it was, you know, three and a half years of negotiation. But what was especially satisfying to me was also the reaction of the residents, you know, ar around the Mel Reese facility in the future Miami Freedom Park, which are the residents of District 1. You know, um, I've had multiple conversations with them. Um, I think that they've been very well represented um, by Commissioner Diaz de la Portilla. And really what happened on Thursday um, leading up to that was, was the commissioners, you know, um, Commissioner Carollo, Commissioner King, Commissioner Diaz La Portilla, as well as Commissioner Russell, you know, getting the best deal for the voters and the residents of the city of Miami. There was a lot of moving pieces here. Um, I think the structure and the elements of the deal were always there, um, which is a 100% privately financed private development and stadium that is unprecedented in the landscape of American sports. And it's a project that will derive two major components that I think are important and can get lost on what we're doing. We're going to create the largest park in the city of Miami. We're going to deliver a 58 acre park open to the public where families and future generations of Miamians can go there and enjoy the outdoors, green space. And in, you know, in, in addition to that, you know, it's going to be generating significant revenue to the city of Miami through the ground lease, through taxes, through property taxes, and most importantly, through economic development, this is a project that's going to generate over 15,000 jobs. Um, it's going to create in the initial term of 39 years over $11 billion in direct and indirect labor benefits. 
So I think when you look at the project of his whole, uh, at a whole, the structure was there. But I'm very happy that, you know, all of the commissioners had their ass for their districts, um, you know, from Commissioner Diaz Aportia to make sure that, you know, the impact, uh, any impact on this is not only mitigated, but becomes positive by investing dollars in, in District 1, yeah. you know, with Commissioner King and Commissioner Caroyo and others. I, I think this is something that, um, you know, is going to benefit all of the city of Miami districts and community. You know, I, I have to tell you, in, in reporting this for what feels like 10 years now, but I know it's been the last three where the rubber has hit the road, but in reporting this, we've really heard the, the opposition is not to you, it's not to the team, it's not about the plan. The opposition was really to the elected officials to get the kind of best deal. Uh, and then there is just general philosophical opposition for private enterprise on public land. And I know you've heard all of those things. And, and you've also heard the cliche, the devil is in the details. And I will say, you you do have a site, Miami Freedom Park has a site with, with pretty fair transparency on what's happening. But, but the real opposition that we've heard is that people are just afraid of what goes on behind the scenes. And so I wonder if you could dig in a little bit into maybe some of the, the promises that you made and the asks that you got that you didn't fill. What Was there a commissioner who asked for something besides parks, besides jobs and union participation uh, and green space that, that the team and you really didn't think you were able to come up to? Yes, and let, and let me go into those details. I think it's important. And, and listen, we you know we can't lose sight of that. You know, the crux of this is is to bring Inter Miami back back to its city, to its or back into its city, to its proper home. But let's go into the details, Glenna, because I, I think those are important, and I'd like to share this with the residents. And as I said on the day of the city of Miami three and a half years ago, you know, we're going to be completely transparent in this process. As you all alluded to, we've had a website where every single document, draft, negotiation, communications have been on our website for everyone to see from day one. Um, you know, one of the things, and listen, we've, you know, we, we've, we've all heard and, you know, naysayers and doubts, you know, some people say it's too good to be true. Some people say, oh, Moss and Beckham, you know, what they said three and a half years ago, they're not gonna come through on. Every single thing and every single item that we committed to three and a half years ago um, is, in, is in this proposed lease. We're gonna come through on every single one of our commitments to, to the city. Uh, I was born and I grew up here. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I love my city and the city of Miami, but but to go into the details, you know, a lot of questions arose about, you know, what is the fair market value of the land? Because as I stood and as the agreement and the referendum said that, you know, we would pay fair market value for the land, knowing that that is a contaminated site, knowing that it's going to take substantial cleanup, it's going to take substantial dollars of investment and in infrastructure to have it is what we usually think of a comparable piece of land, because as it is today, you can build absolutely nothing on the Mel Reese golf course. So, you know, the city of Miami went out and hired two nationally recognized appraisal firms and a peer review firm. And this was in September of 2019. And they went ahead and conducted two appraisals. Um, you know, the number that came out of the peer review was $2.3 million a year, which approximates, you know, a land value of approximately 60 to $70 million to, to put it in, in, in terms that I think all of us can understand. But the referendum said $3.6 million in minimum rent. So we were paying 57% over fair market value and granted as of September in 2019. And we're getting a so new, we, new appraisal now because of yes, we are. the years that have yes. passed. Yeah, so uh, we don't know so that number yet, do we? Well, no, but we do know a minimum rent number. And let me get into it, I think it's important. We will pay fair market value for the land and whatever that number ends up being. One of the things that the commissioners, and it was important, especially to Commissioner Caroyo, was increasing the minimum rent irrespective of where, you know, the appraisals came out. So it's, you know, we're, we're going to be paying, you know, minimum of $4.3 million with escalators, you know, over the life of the lease. To put that into perspective over, over 99 years, that's going to be, you know, around approximately $3.5 billion in lease payments. Just to put in that into contrast with the Marlins deals, the taxpayers are paying $2.4 million through a bond issue. So it's a $6 billion swing on, on deals. But, you know, we are going to have two appraisals. As is clean, so these appraisals aren't taking into account the fact that the property is impaired and limited because it is. There's limitations of use. There's limitations of height, very restricted what you can do there. You can put no residential. And the things that are going to go on the property, entertainment district, which includes retail and F&B, hotels and office, is the holy trinity of what was affected by COVID. 
So, you know, those appraisals will come in. It's going to be, you know, whatever the average of, of the two appraisers are and, and we'll move on. So our, you know, our commitment to pay fair market value stands. Um, I think that was something the commissioners wanted and emphasized to me, which, which I, frankly, I'm in agreement to because um, I think that's the right way, um, the right, the right way, the right way to do this deal. The other, the other asset that, that came through, through the commission, for example, you know, all of the commissioners wanted, you know, everybody wanted more, right? Like, like I want more money. I want stricter terms. I want the money up front. And the one thing, Glenna, that that's important is this has to become a project that's buildable, that's viable. We cannot create hurdles that make this an impossible project to build and to construct. Cause as I've said, numerous times the hard part is actually building it and getting it done and it can and i hate to interrupt you but yes it, go ahead it, it's important for people to to understand two things i think one the the no bid component of this deal is you know a lot of people are looking at you as a very well connected businessman with deep roots in the community who get special favors um i i know that possibly is a portion of what's going on here, but there's also the no bid component that there was no other MLS soccer team available. You and David Beckham had that team. But but that aside, is there the the complex that's going around the soccer, soccer stadium is your financing ability to not take public money. Is that correct? I mean, you need that portion to pay for what you're doing. Well, 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 yes. I mean, stadiums on their own don't work. They don't work economically, financially. I don't think they're economic generators for the city. And, and Glenn, let me address the no bid issue because I think it's important. When we presented this plan three and a half years ago, we had two options. We, one was, was to have an RFP and put it out for bid. And the other one was to ask the voters of Miami for permission to do a no bid process. And that's the route we chose at that time, thinking it would be faster, but we chose that route. So we asked the city of Miami residents, will you allow us to sit with the city of Miami and negotiate a deal on a no bid basis? That is exactly what the referendum said. So yeah. I think that there is no better uh, way to get permission to do something in no bid than go directly to the voters. That's direct democracy. So oh, on, on that note. Yes. Let me uh, let me just interrupt you to take a, a quick break. We have a couple of things to talk about when we come back, but we need to take sure. a quick commercial break. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. We are back with Jorge Mas, Inter Miami's owner, who won the ability to go forward with the billion dollar Miami Freedom Park this week. Jorge, we were talking about the referendum, about the vote that put this into yes. motion three years ago. Ten years ago, I think my kids were still in high school when we were at uh, the PAM, <laughs> when you first made this announcement with David Beckham. And before we go on, where was David Beckham at that commission meeting? He wasn't there for the yes. No, he wasn't there for the yes. But but he had been here the three previous times before we got the, the, the meetings postponed. But David David was in London watching, following uh, the meeting, sending texts and cheers. So David is... Uh, extremely ecstatic it's been it's been a journey for him since he he decided to join major league soccer when he came over from real madrid to play at the la galaxy i'm very appreciative to him to believe in miami because he chose miami he believes in this city and the reason that all of this is happening is because this is you know initially and originally david beckham's dream so he got a you know, crash david, course in miami politics he, over the past decade or so. yeah yes he did only only in miami <laughs> So let's uh, let's go back to um, you know I want to get from you sort of the timeline in the in reading the details of the lease, which is changing based on Thursday. Um, so the timeline now it's going to be is it fair to say it's going to be years before the remediation is done on the toxic land and you can even put a, a shovel in for development. What well, what is the timeline now? Uh, then the next steps are we go through um, zoning and planning. So there's a special area plan approval. Um, Frankly, we have already started that process with the city. So that's been some some months and there have been comments and a significant amount of work that's gone to, into that. But we anticipate that um, the ability for us to get on site and start the remediation will take anywhere from six to eight months. So, you know, we're hoping and targeting that, you know, by, by the end of the year or very, very early in 23, we can start the remediation work um, because the first work that we have to do is clean up the site, deliver all of the infrastructure, deliver the public park, before we start vertical construction on the stadium. So there is a process now for, for six to eight months uh, that we're gonna be going through through zoning and approval and entitlements. Uh, so there's still a, a little time before we start the construction on the site. 
Is there any doubts that you have? Because this is a pretty complicated process from the get-go. A lot of moving parts, 3D chess. Is there any doubt that you're going to run up against the kind of issue that will prevent you from building or doing what you had planned? And sort of the hidden question in that question is, the city getting its remuneration and, and its tax revenue and its component of this deal, um, what what are the challenges and the doubts that, that you may have? Well, I mean, there's going to be several challenges. There's going to be a lawsuit over this process, um, over the referendum. The typical people who, who, who file lawsuits against really, you know, most city of Miami projects, I don't think that'll delay us. We'll just go through that process. I think they'll be very short in nature. Our interests are aligned with the city of Miami. Glenna, you know, we all want this project built as quickly as possible in order to, you know, have the economic benefits and jobs uh, start generating. My one ask on Thursday, um, which which I think was very clear and was, was addressed, was we need an expedited permit process. We need to be able to go there and not face, unfortunately, the delays on times that are, that are that are faced and getting building permits and getting plans through. So if we have the ability to work closely with the city, which I'm 100% confident we will, and able to get expedited permits and be able to go out and, and stay on top of this project, you know, I have a target date that I'd like to see the opening of the 2025 season at the Miami Freedom Park Stadium, which will start in March. You know, I'd love to target the finish in late 24, have a, you know, a good portion of the entertainment district and, and hotel and activities open so that, 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 that there's something you know fun to do at Miami Freedom Park, so so that's our schedule. There is no doubt going to be obstacles, no doubt. There's going to be curveballs, um, but again, you know we're gonna we're gonna work diligently. We're gonna work hard. You know, you know we we don't give up easily. A lot of people, you know, would tell me, Jorge, this is you know, this has got really too hard. It's been three years. You know, why do you keep pushing? You know, it's, I you know, and listen, I push because because I believe in this vision. I believe it's something transformational for our city. I think it's fantastic. And there was there was one resident three and a half years ago when I walked the neighborhood that told me something that still stays with me today. And she said, why not us? And that struck me. And she said, why can't we have a nice park and an entertainment district and a place where my grandchildren can get a good paying job? You know, th that's what drives us, Glenn. And, you know, and again, the vision of representing the voters, bringing Major League Soccer to Miami, doing something fun. Um, that our residents can enjoy um, is something that, you know, we're going to work diligently on and, and you know, we tend to be stubborn. So we're, we'll, we'll fight through all the obstacles. All right. So one more from, from the vision to the detail. One more question. The, uh, not only locally, but, but federally, you're next to Miami International Airport. Uh, height yes. restrictions, noise restrictions, environmental restrictions. Have you cleared this federally and, and done the due diligence with the planning that you won't have to change anything relative to the airport? Well, we've had, you know, a significant amount of communication with, um, you know, the FAA on one side and the aviation authorities here locally, because it's, it's important, number one, that we be a great neighbor and make sure that the economic engine that is the airport uh, in, in Miami-Dade County, you know, actually is enhanced by this and there's no interruptions. We've changed the design of the development in the stadium uh, because of, of some of the height issues. We have some experience in building a, a stadium next to an airport. Our stadium in Fort Lauderdale is actually located closer to a runway um, at Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport than this will be to Miami International. The architect on our project, um, Manica, built the Las Vegas Stadium, which is, you know, adjacent to the Las Vegas Airport. So we have significant experience in how we deal with an airport. We want to be a great neighbor. Uh, there can be no issues. Uh, that's the way that we've conducted this project. And, and yes, we've had communications, and I'm very, very confident that any issues can be mitigated, dealt with, with no interruption to the project whatsoever. Jorge Mas, Inter-Miami owner, so great to see you and so grateful for your time today. And we will be, you know, watching every step of the way, and so will our sports department. <laughs> Thank great you, to have you on the show. Take care. Thank you. Thank you as always. Choice, parents' rights, benchmark testing, big changes coming for Florida schools. The change at the top happened this week. Newly confirmed State Education Commissioner Manny Diaz live right here next.
Education is front and center in Florida politics now, and Florida's new education commissioner, as of Friday, is at the tip of that spear. And that is a familiar place to be for Manny Diaz Jr., Republican state senator from Hialeah, who was confirmed Friday, and he is right here with us live today. What do I call you, Senator, Commissioner, Manny? Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Glenna. Well, still, uh, you know, still officially a senator until June 1st. I'll be <laughs> present for the special session coming up. So uh, that, that would be it for now. <laughs> on, on property insurance and possibly something else, and that's a whole other story. Let's stick to education because that is, uh, boy, is that ever front and center in Florida politics. And it was this sort of, I, this is not a surprise pick. You were not a surprise pick because anyone who followed the session you were right there at the forefront of every education bill, and some were fairly controversial. Uh, was, th was this a, a plan from the beginning? No, I mean, uh, the, the governor went through his progressions on what he wanted to do as far as a recommendation. And look, my track record uh, in, in being involved in education issues in the state, not only this session, but it really goes back 10 years since I, since I started in the House in 2012. Um, you know, on a myriad of issues, uh, public schools, choice, scholarships, teacher pay, uh, all of those things I've, I've touched upon through the years. And so I think that uh, that helped um, convince the governor that this would be the, the right move for the state of Florida and, uh, you know, honored to have his recommendation and the confirmation of the state board who has the same mission. You have such an, an interesting background for this position because the, the state has been moving toward more choice in education, uh, voucher programs, et cetera. You have a, a really long background in public education uh, as a teacher, as an assistant principal, principal, and you have a background with charter companies. Um, so you, you live in both worlds, and I know you know the opposition and the fear for public school advocates is that more choice means uh, a lessening and a taking away from public education. I wonder if you could address that and the trend that we're seeing in Florida. Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, most of my career was spent in the public school classroom and school as a, as a teacher or administrator. So that's correct. And number two, I think, you know, when we, when we use the definition of the word choice, it, it doesn't mean one thing or another. It doesn't necessarily mean scholarships or, or, or charter, even though those are options. I think our public schools provide incredible choices, uh, both with magnet schools, academies or our traditional, you know, neighborhood schools. Uh, as well as virtual programs that exist. So I think when I when I say choice and we people talk about choice in Florida, it's really talking about giving parents uh, the, the opportunity to decide what fits for each individual student. Because even if you have multiple kids like I do, uh, they all learn differently. They all they all thrive differently. And uh, and having those choices for each individual child uh, is what's important. Uh, and obviously, we're we're uh, in tune with the, the teacher shortage and the shortage of employees in all sectors obviously is going to affect that, but we're gonna come out of the gate looking at that issue to try to address it right away. You know, you as a state senator during session, you really carried a couple of bills having to do with education that really got a lot of pushback. One of them was the individual freedom bill. Uh, most people have heard that as the stop woke bill, the anti CRT bill, of course, those are the tags given to it. That was actually a bill that you carried. And then there was the bill that was actually called parents rights in education the world started hearing about it as don't say gay. That that wasn't your bill, but you did really present it uh, for Senator Baxley. And you had a very interesting um, take on those bills, much less combative, much less uh, vindictive than some of your opposition would like to broadcast. Um, and if it seems like I'm picking my words carefully, I am, because I like to be very fair and very objective. But I wonder if you could take those two bills where there was such fear, genuine fear, from your colleagues that you value, and, and frame it, w what kind of changes, practically speaking, do you think those bills, now law, will affect as we go into this next school year, if any? As, as always in the legislative process, there's there's what's in the actual bill and what gets talked about in the headlines, what gets uh, ventured about in the discussion. And I think, look, these are these are common sense things. Number one, uh, on the parent rights bill, having having students in kindergarten through third grade um, not have these materials addressed as part of lessons in classrooms where they're not mature enough and things need to be age appropriate. Combine that with the 
the fact that we value the rights of parents and really parents should be involved whenever there's a change in monitoring um, or, or in services at a school, it's, it's incredibly important that you're going to have success with the student, regardless of what the issue is, that you have these parents involved. To me, that's just common sense. Um, number two, when we talk about the indiv individual freedom bill, we're talking about making sure that education is objective, that students have all of the difficult discussions and, and it doesn't eliminate those difficult discussions. But we have to be, we have to maintain uh, the, the original intent of education, that is to spark discussion, to have students debate, to have students make critical thinking decisions for themselves and to leave some, you know, more of the views and the social issues uh, again, as part of the parents' responsibility and the family's responsibility at home, a teacher, you know, as a teacher in the classroom, uh, I always was very uh, cognizant that I should not impose my political views or any other views on students, but I should prompt them to have discussion, debate, and at the end of a semester or the end of a course, students should not know where I stand ideologically or politically, and I think that still stands today. We need to impart information and have them have those vigorous discussions. I, I guess the, and the question is, was that happening? Were these really, uh, you know, parents' rights and education, that, that's sort of a national focus right now in, in politics as well. Um, and, and that's something I think that every parent can get behind. But were those things happening in schools? I, I know the governor uses the word indoctrination a lot. Do, do you feel, as an educator, were students being indoctrinated? Did that need to be fixed? I guess that's really my question. Well, and the question really is, we, we don't need to wait for something to happen uh, to, to say that it's not right in our system. But there are cases. We have examples from different districts, both with the parent rights. One of the, the glaring uh, cases that came up was, you know, a change of services, uh, of, of providing some kind of therapy or, or moving in a direction with a specific student, elementary school student, and never notifying the parent. I mean, I think that's egregious. I think we have to protect that relationship where the parent needs to be involved, especially with these younger students. And in classrooms where we've seen um, teachers really impose, we've had all kinds of examples from across the state where people are, ex the teachers are ex exposing or imposing views on students. That shouldn't be happening. And again, this all aligns with the fact that we've changed our standards and we have to be in line with the state standards and state law to make sure that we're providing students the best education possible. And again, prompting that discussion, that debate, uh, having students really critically think about things. You, you know, uh, the other thing that we want to talk about are textbooks, the math textbooks, uh, so many of which were rejected. Some added back just this week. That's a really interesting process, and I want to talk to you about that. But first, a quick break, so we'll see you in two. We are back with Senator Manny Diaz Jr., Republican of Hialeah, soon to be the state's new education commissioner. Senator Diaz, I wanted to talk to you about the textbooks uh, earlier this month, math textbooks. 41% on the list were rejected by the state um, because of what the governor calls woke content. Uh, I was on the website for DOE. There's a big black box on the top, and it says publishers are aligning instructional materials to the standards, removing the woke content. Uh, the department is, has added back 17 more books. So um, it, it looks like they're in this process of saying to publishers, here's what we want, here's what we don't want. Publishers are aligning those goals and Florida will have its math textbooks back. Is that a read on it that's valid? Yeah, but I mean, this is not a unique process. This happens every year with a different subject matter, uh, the process of adoption. And, you know, th there's confusion with the word rejected. You know, what it is, is you can submit your materials. They're reviewed by teachers and individual reviewers that are uh, pros at this and check against the, the best standards, which are new standards. And if you don't meet that requirement, then the book is not going to be adopted. But the publisher does have the opportunity to make changes and that goes for the law as well it has to comply with elements of the law with you know the individual freedom act and and um other laws that have been passed so it has to be within that but a, a lot of times what's happened here uh glenna is that there's been a problem or two terms they've used or out of alignment uh with with standards and they have the opportunity to amend and notify the department and resubmit it and a lot of what you're seeing is the approval of books who have made some of those corrections because 
the publishers do want to be in Florida and they, they agree that they need to line up with the standards. So you actually sort of answered what my next question was going to be, which was this sounds almost like standard operating procedure anyway. This goes on every year. So what was different about this year that all of this made such headlines? Was it the reason they were rejected? What this this word woke content that's that's sort of made, making headlines in the state now? Or, or is this just standard operating procedure? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think per, number one, it's standard operating procedure, but a lot of people don't normally don't pay attention to this process. And, and there's this this kind of issue every year and there's amendments made and changes made. But, you know, with the addition of the new standards and the state board rule that exists and some of the laws that have passed, uh, woke content is not, you know, quote unquote, woke content is not allowed in the state of Florida in, in those standards and with the law. And so it has to be changed. Plus, you know, some of the publishers apparently had made some decisions when it came to mathematics content, when there's things in mathematics content that really doesn't belong there, it belongs in other places in our education system. So these books should be about math and math problems and getting our students to learn math. So the social and emotional learning component, I think, is what you were talking about, right? Because that that became fairly controversial. Social and emotional learning um, was, is supposed to be a, a, a good thing, an advanced method of teaching, but problematic in math books. Yeah, math, look, math curriculum should be about math curriculum. We should be learning how to do fractions, how number lines, all of that stuff. Uh, some of that other stuff is left to other professionals in the school system, to other subject areas. That's the way it should function. And math needs to be about math. So the last thing I really wanted to ask you for um, the short time that we have together is there's there's really going to be this big overhaul in how kids are tested now in school. Uh, FSA, the Florida standards are going away. FCATs are going away. I think everybody got behind that. Nobody liked FCATs. Um, so what what we're learning is that there's going to be these new benchmark testings now. And, and some people who had called to to really oppose things like that, uh, what I heard from them was that they're not taking tests away, they're adding tests. But I never got that that was a number. The number of tests really were not the issue. It's the kind of test. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what to expect with this new benchmark testing. Um, and how will it be different from what teachers hate about teaching to the test and high stress and high stakes testing? What's the difference? What can we expect from that? Well, that's a great question, uh, Glenn. And I think you really have to get in the weeds for people to understand that, which is these first two are, uh, benchmarks are formative exams. And formative exams are not high stakes or, or um, anxiety producing. They're really to measure where a student is at and provide the teacher, the information, in this case, the teacher, the parent, the student, the information on what they need to learn moving forward. It's really a, uh, a measure to adjust instruction and drive instruction. There's still one summative exam at the end of the year, and that, that makes us compliant with federal law. But that, that end of the year summative exam are, is covering the materials that should be learned throughout the year. And be because we're going to have progress monitoring, Everyone, the teachers, the school, the parents, the students should know where the student is at at that point and what adjustments need to be made. Uh, really no different than what a teacher has always done with their grade book, right? If you were in class, you remember your teacher having a grade book with unit test and quiz before you ever had the, the big, you know, end of end of term exam or the midway point exam. It's the same kind of thing, but we're going to leverage the technology to reduce testing. And re by the way, reduce testing time, Glenna, which is the big a big deal here uh, when we're talking about this. Senator Manny Diaz, soon to be Florida Education Commissioner, come June 1st. Great to have you on the program. We value your time as always, and best of luck to you in your new role. Thank you very much, Glenna. Good to be with you. Florida is about to have an elections police force, just part of the new elections law the governor signed this week. Change is a coming, and we take that dive. Three months and change to go until the August primaries and Florida has a new police force focused on election crimes and some tweaks to state election law. The governor signed that bill into law this week and depending on your perspective, it either tightens election security or potentially disenfranchises minority votes or both.
Florida's election supervisors in 67 counties now putting to all those changes into place and figuring out how they work. And in Broward, that would be Joe Scott. And he is here to break all that down with us. Hi, Joe. Good afternoon, Glenda. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being with us. Um, you are an administrative role. I just want to say that right off the top, not a political role. And yet you maneuver the political will. So if you know the just so everybody knows who is not in the weeds, 22, there were some more changes, not just changes, but in election year 21 or uh, session year 21, there were some changes. So we have a lot of new election law that you have to administer a lot of focus on the new police force. So let's start there. Does sure. this new police force uh, 25 positions eventually the governor allocated lawmakers allocated two point six million dollars to fund this. Does that have any bearing on your office or how you administer elections at all. Uh, you know, so uh, as you know, and a lot of people out there know I was not for the law that passed and I didn't I don't think that this police force is a good idea. I think it's a massive waste of money. Um, however, now that it's the law of the land and these folks are going to be part of the team in ensuring that we have um, free and fair elections. So at this point, I'm looking forward to engaging with this, um, the, the new folks that are going to be working in the um, secretary of state's office and, and, and seeking their help to make sure that we have the best election security anywhere. You know, the the bill had more in it than actually became law. One of the things that was stripped out of the bill was something that I think you had said that you were opposed to, and that was more identification required for the vote by mail ballot. That was taken out before the governor signed this into law. But one of the bigger changes is the ballot drop boxes. They now have a name, right? Secure ballot intake stations. How will secure right. ballot intake stations differ from the drop boxes that everyone, especially during COVID, really came to love? Uh, so, you know, so what's interesting is, is that the law really, what they did is they crossed out the word drop box and they replaced it with the word secure ballot intake station. So that's the most substantive thing that happened. <laughs> so as far as, as far as how the, um, you know, there's really no change. It's a change of the name of it. Um, you know, my view on this is that it's going to be extremely confusing. Most people just don't follow the day to day changes in legislation. So, you know, if we're out there talking about a secure ballot intake station, the average voter isn't going to have a clue what we're talking about. All right. So, so what, but cool. I guess the, the practical question is, tell your voters, are you still going to be able to take your vote by mail ballot and fill it out and put it in that little box that where are the boxes and will they be secure? Hmm. And and what's the difference? Right. So as as was uh, as has been the law and uh, the change, the biggest change happened with SB 90 last year, the law that passed in 2021 uh, basically changed the way we handle drop boxes in the state of Florida. What happened this year was a change of the name. So, you know, based on what happened last year, you know, for Broward County in particular, we're going to have eight different locations that you'll be able to drop off your ballot. Most weekdays will after the vote by mail ballots go out until Election Day. And then during early voting, there'll be 22 locations, which are all of the um, all of our early voting sites will also be places that folks can go and drop their ballot uh, and drop their ballot off um, in terms of, you know, the way we communicate with the public. You know, I don't see much of a change there because I really don't want to confuse people. So there's not a huge change in in, in how we're going to communicate with the public. And there's really no change from the most recent special elections that we had. Uh, you know, the change, the, the drop boxes will still be the same. You know, part of this bill has a, an amendment. There was a well, law had an amendment. It was put in by Senator Annette Tadeo of Miami, Democrat of Miami. And it was put in by her as a direct result of a local 10 investigation. And we found that there were operatives, third party uh, voter registration organizations changing people's parties without their knowledge. And so an amendment to this law stiffens the penalties for that, which is a kind of voter fraud. Um, and so as a elections supervisor who has those roles and what voter is what party, is your office doing anything, any kind of outreach to let voters know that they need to take responsibility for where they're registered, how they're registered, and what party they're registered for prior to those primaries. 
Absolutely. So, you know, we, that is part of our regular outreach efforts is to make sure that people are aware that Florida is a closed primary state and that you can only vote in the primary of the party that you're registered with. Um, we do run into these problems every cycle where people will show up to vote in the primary and then discover they're not uh, registered with the party that they for, you know, there'll be a particular candidate that they want to support and they'll get to the polls and find out I'm not registered with that candidate's party. I cannot vote. You know, so this is a regular thing that has always happened um, and we expect that it will continue to happen. You know, what, what went on with that third party organization is uh, absolutely despicable because of the fact that we're a closed primary state. And when they change people's parties, you know, you're not going to necessarily change the way people vote. Uh, people are going to vote the way they want to vote, but they might be locked out of voting in a primary election that they would like to vote in. Um, so, you know, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense for folks to go out there and do that kind of thing. And and change people's voter registration. It's not going to get more votes for any particular candidate. Um, and, um, and, you know, so really that's the communication that we try to put out there is to let people know that they need to check that. So you, you had said you were not in favor of this law passing and there is huge opposition from groups who really feel like minority voters will be disenfranchised, that their votes will be harder to do. They might be blocked from the polls. Can, can you explain how, practically speaking, this new law might have might do that? So one thing for us in the new law um, that that really sticks that really stuck out for us in Broward County is the requirement to have um, our branch offices operate 40 hours a week if we want to have a drop box at the branch offices. So it was just really an additional. Um, it's, it's more or less adding more requirements, adding more um, administrative um, uh, spend. More, we have to spend more money, basically, in order to have a drop box available. So instead of just coming out and outright banning the drop boxes, um, it's, it's more or less like we just keep um, turning the screws and making it more and more expensive um, so that eventually counties just opt out and decide not to have them or end up having far fewer than they would have normally had. So one thing about the state of Florida is that you have to have the ballot back to the supervisor of elections by 7 p.m. on election night. And that's really what drives people to want to use a drop box instead of sending it through the mail. So it's really important for us to have as many drop boxes as possible. And the law makes it so that it's more expensive for us to have a drop box anywhere. But, but isn't the onus, though, on the voter, whether or not, I mean, there, there was a time when there were no drop boxes at all. It wasn't even a thing. So isn't the onus on the voter to just make sure your voter registration is correct, make sure you know where to vote and when, make sure your IDs are correct, and go vote? It, it sounds like it should not be that complicated of a process. Right. And, and I see my role as the supervisor of elections to try to make the process as easy and inviting as possible for as many voters as possible. Understanding that the average the average citizen, the average voter out there is focused on their job, they're focused on their families, they're working hard. And, and when it comes time to vote in an election, you know, they don't know the ins and outs of election law. So we need to make things simple. We need to make it convenient. So some of the rules that we have here in Florida make it extremely difficult for voters. Um, saying that, you know, if they were to discover that their party registration is wrong, two weeks before an election, it's too late to change it. Um, uh, in, in the case of a primary, uh, we would want to vote in a primary. So there's just these things that are in the law. Um, and as far as drop boxes, it's about making the system easier and more accessible to the average citizen. And that is where we come in, our role come in, uh, comes in as well as you. Joe Scott, Supervisor Election in Broward County, great to have you on the program and great to have everybody joining us on the program as always. We thank you for being with us. And remember, we are online at local10.com 24-7. Have a beautiful Sunday.